Hello again, members. Welcome back for another THF conversation. I'm Catherine McMacken, Membership Manager here at the Henry Ford, and I'm so excited to share today's program with you. For nearly three centuries, American women have made quilts to fill their family's need for warmth, to express their creativity, or to communicate a message. The quilts displayed in Greenfield Village are only the tip of our museum's quilt iceberg. And today we'll be headed on a virtual stroll through textile storage to enjoy a look at quilts with stories to tell, artistry to share, or a message to communicate. We'll savor some behind the scenes looks at longtime favorites, as well as recently acquired quilts. And we'll find out how they came into our collections here at the Henry Ford. Uh, our guest today is Gina Miller, Curator of Domestic Life, and she has been part of the Henry Ford for nearly 47 years, interpreting history to visitors, working in a theater department, working as an archivist, and as a curator. Her passion for the Henry Ford and for quilt making arrived around the same time. In the mid-1970s, during the bicentennial years, Jeannie began her career as a Greenfield Village presenter while she was a student in college. She learned to quilt from her Kentucky-born grandmother shortly after that. And now, for over 15 years, uh, to her delight, Jeannie has counted the museum's quilts among the collections she curates. And we have so much to learn from Jeannie, and I can't wait to uh, explore more about our special collection of quilts. Uh, as always, while you enjoy the program, please submit any questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, um, and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. Uh, and of course, to our members, thank you again for your ongoing support of the Henry Ford. We are so grateful that you continue to join us in our commitment to our mission as we activate new programming, new exhibits, and favorite experiences. Uh, so now I'll hand it over to Jeannie uh, to take us through a virtual look at our quilts in our textile storage. Hello, everyone. It's so lovely that you could join us today. Um, in the past 15 years, we have done a lot of work documenting the quilts in our collection. Um, research that has built on and added to the work of our prior colleagues. So um, I am just delighted to be able to share a few of the quilts, as many as I can in our time together, um, from our collection through this kind of virtual behind the scenes look. Now, I may be glancing at my notes, but um, I want to make sure that I share everything that I had planned. Now, it Maybe a little hard to see some of the details um, when viewing the quilts through this PowerPoint, but near the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you how to get a closer look at our quilts. So as we go, you might want to make a note of um, any quilts that you might want to explore further. Okay, next please. And I must thank Anita Davis um, from our staff, who is going to be running the slide presentation for you for me. Thanks, Anita. All right, so how many quilts do we have? We have 435, and they date from the 1700s to the very present. Um, on the left, or on the right of the screen, is this undaunted quilt that was very recently made during the early part of the pandemic. Our quilt collection includes a variety of styles and traditions from the very exquisitely crafted masterpieces to the very humbly utilitarian. So next slide. Okay, so what is a quilt? Because not everybody quilts. So a quilt is actually made of three layers generally. There's the top layer of fabric, which might be pieced, appliqued, or made of all one kind of cloth. And I'll talk about that in a second. Then there's the filler, which provides the warmth. And that's often a cotton batting. And then there's a fabric backing. And um, as you can see from the lady there on the right, um, when the three layers are stitched together, that's actually the quilting. And this uh, occurred for centuries by hand, and now it can be done by machine. Next, please. 
All right, so we talked about pieced quilts. These are where you sew the pieces together, you seam them together, and you can see um, below the Lady of the Lake pieced quilt some uh, examples from the Webster House table of some quilt pieces being put together. Now, applique quilt, you um, turn under the edges of your fabric design and then sew them to the backing. Um, as you can see in that example down at the lower right. So this is sewed right on um, a backing. And remember this princess feather applique quilt, because a little bit later, we're gonna looking, be looking at a, uh, a very creative variation on that pattern. Now, whole cloth quilt is all made of the same fabric. Um, oh, could you go back for a sec? Um, I'll tell you a little secret about accession numbers. These are the um, ID numbers assigned to objects when they come into the collection. The first set of decimals is the year that uh, quilts came in. So here you can see two of the quilts came in in the 1970s. The zero zero means we don't really know when it came in because record keeping uh, was not what it is now, um, 80 some years ago. And also if there's no maker name mentioned on the quilt, uh, then we don't know. So let's take a little virtual stroll down the aisle in our next slide, where our quilts are kept in temperature and humidity controlled storage. Most of them lie folded in these drawers. We do have a few very large drawers where some of the quilts can be laid out flat, but most um, are in these drawers. And if you can see the tissue paper in some of the, the quilt there to the left, we pad the um, quilts so that they don't get fold lines in them. And then occasionally we refold them so that um, they don't get uh, fold lines pressed in them. And now you can see why we need to look at the quilts in PowerPoint because we couldn't get a very good view in those drawers. All right, well, the Henry Ford has been collecting quilts since Henry Ford's era dating back um, from the 1920s through the 40s when Ford was gathering items for his museum. Um, not only did Ford really love technological advancements um, in American life, but he felt it was really important to preserve the things that Americans had used in their everyday life, including quilts. And just like today, um, we have acquired quilts both um, through purchase and donation over the years. And here are a couple of examples of quilts that came in during Henry Ford's era. This feathered star on the left was purchased from an antique dealer in Milan, Ohio in 1929. And the log cabin quilt on the right came from a donor in Connecticut. Um, a lot of times people would send us uh, quilts or send Henry Ford quilts that had been in their family um, during this time. All right, people also um, sent him quilts that they had just made recently. And this American pride quilt made in the early 30s um, is one such quilt. Um, we knew it was made by a Mrs. J.G. Taylor, uh, Taylor. She was the wife of the doctor, and she said she made it to enter a Sears quilt contest, though it didn't win, um, and that she was the wife of a country doctor. Well, we know a lot about that, but some online research actually told us what her name was, Zemma Haynes Taylor. And um, also we uh, researched the Sears National Quilt Contest, which was organized by the Sears Roebuck Company in connection with the Chicago World's Fair in 1933. Sears offered $7,500 in prizes, including a grand prize of $1,000. So by offering um, 
such large prizes during the depression when the nation's economy wasn't good, this set into motion this huge amount of quilt making from people who had, uh, who were experts who had made a lot of quilts to people who were trying their hand at it perhaps for the first time. So more than 24,000 quilts were entered into this contest, making it the largest quilt context contest in history. And so the effects of this contest were long lasting. Um, next slide, please. But we weren't even sure if the lady who sent it to us was the maker of the quilts or just the donor. We found that out by finding this letter that you see reproduced here um, from Mrs. Taylor to Henry Ford. Um, Henry Ford's collecting was handled by his office um, known as the Henry Ford Office um, Papers. Uh, these were his private um, interests, not his running the automotive company. So a lot of the correspondence is still in this collection, which is down in the archives. So we knew her name, we knew about when it came in, so down we went, found this letter, and it told us the rest of the story. She told us why she had sent the quilt to Henry Ford. She admired his um, pacifist efforts during World War II with his um, peace ship in 1915. She was appreciative of his $5 day profit sharing um, for his employees, which helped um, put a lot more people in the middle class. And she loved what the Model T did for doctors, especially country doctors like her own husband, who uh, of course had to make, uh, they did house calls back then. And instead of having to um, put the horse to the buggy, you could just get in your Model T Ford and you see the ad down there that says dependable as the doctor himself. So um, by doing this research, you end up with this very delightfully, I call it emotionally tactile way, um, uh, to experience the quilt. And so the quilt and its story capture many of the reasons why Ford was such a folk hero to many Americans. But the quilt's also grown in complexity, evolving from this kind of charming patriotic quilt to one that connects to the larger context of American history as well. Next slide, please. So we do a lot of this research with various um, quilts in our collection. Now you see this one, it came to us in 72 and from the family. So we knew who made it and we knew where it had been made. It was made by Henrietta Johnson Wilson of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and you can just enjoy this for its absolute beauty. But once again, the experience grows richer by digging in a little bit deeper and learning more of its context. Next slide, please. So we looked up census records and found out that Henrietta was about 60 when she made this and she was living in her son's household. So she didn't have to run a house. So this tells us that she probably would have had more leisure time um, to make such a quilt because she wasn't burdened with um, you know, uh, running a household or chasing after toddlers. And um, another interesting point is that um, the chintz applique floral decoration that you see in the corners by this, the star of this quilt. Um, in 1850, when this quilt was probably made, this style would have been, it's basically a printed fabric that you cut out and you applique onto the backing. And this was kind of old fashioned by this time, but you can imagine it still appealing to a woman in her early 60s. The other thing that we discovered um, from the quilt it's, itself is that it was made by two different hands. You can see the difference in the stitches, um, indicating that Henrietta probably had help making the quilt. So from looking at the people in the household and also the Kentucky Federal Slave Census, um, we figured uh, the help might have come from her daughter-in-law, one of her older granddaughters, or maybe even one of the enslaved females um, might have assisted Henrietta. We're never gonna know for sure, but 
still this um, recently unearthed information provides these richer details of Henrietta's life and really helps you experience this quilt in new ways. Next, please. This gorgeous real variation quilt um, came to us in the late 70s and we were told it was probably a Quaker quilt. And the reason they said that was because all the blocks in this autograph quilt, and I'll show you that in a moment, um, were given equal importance. So there's a nine non-hierarchical sensibility about this. It is kind of a friendship quilt, probably a presentation piece, because each of those squares has either a handwritten or stamped name on it. So we had these names. And we began to research them and found that many of them had ties to the Bucks County um, area, uh, area in Northampton Township. And that a lot of them seemed to belong to the Dutch Reformed Church, not the Quaker Church. And interestingly enough, recently photos of this very similar privately owned quilt were sent to me. And um, it's made about the same time um, as ours. Um, and the owner was told that it was probably Quaker. Well, she had done some research in the meantime and found the same thing we did, that a lot of these people seem to be related to the Dutch Reformed Church. Um, so here's an example of research providing further context. Um, that is actually conducted both by us and by um, others outside the institution. Now, I said I would give you a close up of the um, signature or one of the signatures on the quilt, which you can see on this slide. Um, and this is actually um, printed with um, ink stencils because in the mid 19th century, um, a lot of quilts were marked with these ink stencils, um, which were actually made for marking your household linens. And um, sometimes people use them to print signatures on these autograph blocks. Okay, of course, now one way or the other, all quilts tell a story, but the story, uh, but story or narrative quilts do so through images. This is a quilt made during the bicentennial. Um, she called it the Sons of Liberty. And it was made by Della Mae Morris of Arcadia, Kansas. Um, this is a completely original design depicting scenes from the American uh, Revolutionary War. It is both pieced and appliqued and has other sorts of embellishments on it. Um, Della grew up in rural Kansas and her mom taught her to quilt and she quilted all her life and she claims to have made over 400 quilts. So at the time of the bicentennial, Della decided she was going to make a quilt to celebrate the nation's 200th um, birthday. And she and her daughter-in-law and grandson designed these 18 scenes. She um, worked eight or 10 to 12 hours a day for nine months to get this done. She did complete it in time for the bicentennial. She had it done by May of 1976. And virtually all of the sewing on this quilt, um, the piecing and applique was done by hand. Now, Della entered it into the National Grange Bicentennial Quilt Contest, and the Grange is a uh, farmer's organization. Um, she won first place in Kansas and third at the National in um, Atlantic City, New Jersey. And coming up are a few details from the quilt where you can just see this very charming, almost uh, folk arty look um, to this. You see Paul Revere on his ride, and Betsy Ross is stitching away at the flag. And um, I love the Valley Forge one as well. One of my favorite things is the soldier who's got his feet up by the fire trying to stay warm. Now we'll look at a story quilt that actually helps tell the story of someone's life. 
This is a Hmong story quilt by Moa Tao made in the late 1980s. Um, the Hmong people had been kind of um, driven by political reasons from China into other um, areas nearby. And um, at the close of the Vietnam War, um, a lot of these um, folks had helped uh, fight against North Vietnam. Um, when the war ended, um, they began immigrating to escape political pressure. So many um, were in these um, Thailand refugee camps and they began leaving for the US in December and January of 1975 to 76. And this migration would um, continue in the coming decades um, with um, Hmong people ending up in a lot of places around the world. Now, these people had to leave nearly all of their possessions behind. So they were destitute. Um, when they um, spent time in these refugee camps, the missionaries that ran them encouraged the women to produce items for sale to Western markets to make money for themselves. So um, embroidering their experiences onto textile squares. And while needlework skills are traditional to Hmong culture, story cloths are not. And um, generally the Hmong people prefer bright and bold colors, but the missionaries encourage um, hues that they thought would better appeal to American tastes. So what you end up with is this very kind of unique blend of aesthetics to these amazing quilts. Um, we'll take a look at a few of the details on the quilts. Um, Moa Tao embroidered this quilt with the scenes of life in the um, Laos village that she had left behind early in her life. So these scenes depict um, scenes from the village, ceremonies, and celebrations. She started making this in a Thai refugee camp um, in late 1987, and she worked on it two months there and finished it in Detroit after 10 months of work. At this time, Moa was um, 63 years old and just did a spectacular job on this quilt. Now, women have not only used quilts to tell a story, but also to raise funds, express opinions, or advocate for social change. Um, this Dryden community quilt actually is more accurately called an embroidered bed cover because it's not really pieced, um, appliqued, or even quilted. Um, and it was a community fundraiser. It was raffled off to make money to build the new Methodist Episcopal Church in Dryden. And all of these quilt blocks bear the names of people from this small town who probably paid to have their names put on the quilt and then it was um, raffled off. The quilt was made by a lady named Ella Man Waring with her daughter Clytie. And Ella's husband owned the uh, drugstore on Main Street. And very unusually for a 19th century woman, Ella was a registered pharmacist while working at her husband's drugstore. Let's uh, take a look at a couple of the details, um, squares from the quilt. And I, I always think of this quilt as kind of the quilt version of the Thornton Wilder play, Our Town. Um, Our Town tells the story of the fictional uh, small town of Grover's Corners um, during the early 1900s through the everyday lives of its citizens. So this quilt provides a kind of similar snapshot of the rural community of Dryden in um, 1891. And some of these things read like characters uh, from central casting, like S.E. Randolph, the milliner, um, in the 19th century, running a millinery shop, making hats, was one of the few ways that um, an unmarried woman um, could make a living. And in 1891, um, 52-year-old Sarah Elizabeth Randolph had operated her shop for more than 20 years. Um, Edward Weaver, on the other hand, is pairing a couple of 
traditional, um, or I should say a traditional pairing of 19th century occupations. He's both a furniture dealer and an undertaker. So he probably, um, you know, he made wooden coffins in addition to um, furniture. So you can see um, he sold baby carriages as well as caskets, taking care of needs of people from cradle to grave. This next quilt with a cause was created by a group of women to advocate for social change. This is a very recent acquisition. We got it last year and it was made a few years ago in 2017. And it was made by um, women with talent um, and using their voices to take a stand against racism and they made a difference. This quilt is absolutely beautifully made. If you can see some of the machine quilting in that detail at the top left, um, this is all freehand, it's not computer done. Um, that is incredible. The design is beautiful and the statement is powerful. Um, fashion and cosmetic companies have long used the term nude for products made in a pale beige, um, really only reflecting lighter skin tones uh, and marginalizing people of color as the other. Um, and after one company, uh, fashion company repeatedly dismissed a customer's concerns. Um, this customer was a woman of color and um, they were dismissing her concerns about this new line of fashion called Nude. Um, and they were really kind of rude about it. Um, this global community of quilters produced this quilt to oppose this racial bias. And all of those little shirt blocks on the gown that the um, figure wears are all fabrics chosen by the women who participated, um, colors that they felt best represented their own skin tones. So um, this, the quilt makes a statement um, that nude is just a color and I mean is not a color and is a state of undress and that there are many many different shades of um, uh, skin tones in the world. And because of their efforts, this quilt gained a lot of attention online. More people became aware of this company's bias and lent their voices to this issue demanding change. And the brand eventually altered the name of the garment collection. Now, if some of you were in the uh, museum earlier this year, uh, I think this went up in late March and was up for about five weeks. Um, we did have the quilt on exhibit in um, the Henry Ford Museum. And over at the left, you see the quilt label where I had asked the quilt maker to contact the women who had contributed to this to give their statements about why they did so. And reading those women's um, statements was very, very powerful. And we do have a blog online about this quilt. So if you want to learn more. Lest you think that all of our quilts by, were made by women, they aren't. We do have one so far made by a man, Herbert James Smith, who was a tailor all of his life. And a lot of his tailoring involved making uniforms for the US Army. During World War II, I mean, sorry, World War I, he made this quilt from mass produced service banners, which you could buy at stores like Woolworth. And so he combined them into this wonderful design and his family told us he loved to sew and was meticulous about his sewing, which I think you can see um, in this lovely quilt. Now, a special strength of our collection are two groups of quilts. Uh, one made by Susanna Hunter of Alabama and the other by Susan McCord of Indiana. Um, both of these women were farm wives. They were ordinary women, but they had an extraordinary talent for quilt making. Uh, Susanna Hunter, whom you see here, was married at 17 and raised a couple of kids and a grandson. And she lived in Wilcox County, Alabama, which um, is the poorest 
county in the United States, even today. And if some of you have heard of G's Bend quilts, um, they come from this same county, but in um, a different part of it. And Susanna probably never went there. Um, I like to say Susanna was living basically a 19th century lifestyle because uh, this is their house, although those trees were not there when Susanna lived um, there. This picture was taken about maybe 12 years ago when I visited the house. Um, but the house had, it was like two rooms, had no running water, electricity, or central heat. Um, so they had to carry their water from a well like a uh, half a mile away. Um, they lit their house with kerosene and you do see a radio and a phonograph here but they had no electricity so the radio was powered by a battery expensive so they didn't have that on super often and the phonograph was a wind-up phonograph now the hunters um Susanna and her husband julius they were tenant farmers and cotton was their cash crop so in addition to like, you know, taking care of her house, she did farm work, she hoed fields, she milked cows, she fed chickens, and she took care of a vegetable garden. And um, she did this all within the context of the discrimination faced by African Americans in the Jim Crow South. Um, now, living in these kind of conditions, uh, you needed a lot of quilts to keep your family warm. People might pile seven on a bed during the winter. And so you have to make a lot of quilts um, often quickly. And so you end up with these improvisational quilts. They're part of a make-do culture, which is one of um, survival and self-sufficiency in impoverished communities in the rural South. And you see this among both black and white people who um, live in these conditions. Nothing goes to waste. Um, they have a lot fewer resources and there's um, a lack of cash. And also often folks are illiterate, so there's less access to magazines and other design um, ideas. So what this does is essentially free them to use their imagination. Um, on the left, you see my favorite Susanna Hunter quilt. Uh, we call it the mosaic medallion quilt because these quilts don't often have names. Um, but she has put together those blocks, which if you, you can especially see this one on the uh, top right, um, that look like um, what we think of as a log cabin quilt where there's a piece in the middle and you build the um, pieces around it. But this is not uniform like they usually are. She just goes at it and um, uses her creativity. Um, and this is actually harder to do than doing a quilt um, where you're just doing repeat blocks and they're all the same. So, you know, to just keep up this continual stream of creativity is um, quite amazing. And um, when I went down to view the quilts in, um, Mobile, Alabama, um, from her family. She had passed away by then. Um, I also had the opportunity to collect um, some of the objects that she had used. So the, the uh, sewing tools that you see on the right are actually hers. And that is her quilt frame um, on the bottom. It's not one of these fancy ones on a stand that um, we all um, use or used to use. It's four boards put together and it looks like the one my grandmother used too. Okay, um, I think we can go on. Um, oh, one thing about Susanna that I love, I mean, she had a small family, comparatively speaking, but she made over a hundred quilts in her lifetime. She was like this quilting demon. And her son, Paul, when I um, interviewed him, said his dad said to Susanna at one point, you quilt too much, you just quilt too much. So, I mean, you can see how obsessed she was um, with her creativity. And um, with these quilts, it's the overall impact that matters. Um, that's it's the visual impact. So if lines aren't straight, um, etc., that doesn't matter. It's what it looks like. So here you see two strip quilts. Strip quilts are an easy way to put together a lot of quilt tops quickly because you just sew things in a strip and then put the strips all together. 
Now on the left, she took a lot of care to um, do a lot of piecing within her strips. And this just looks like modern art. It's like she was ahead of her time. And on the right is another strip quilt. Um, if you use bigger pieces, if you have them at your disposal, you can make a quilt faster. Um, but this kind of gives this um, Mondrian look, um, uh, the artist, um, to her quilts. Okay, And she made all of this from scraps that sometimes she was given. You could buy bags of scraps from the textile mills and clothing manufacturers um, from the South. And here are two more of her quilts coming up. And here's another uh, a quilt called a pig pen. Now, once again, this is a little bit similar to a log cabin where you build out um, by adding pieces around that central um, piece of material. Um, but in the South, it took on a name that would remind people living on these um, tenant farms of things that were familiar to them, like the pig pen. And on the uh, right is this absolutely wonderful quilt made out of her husband's denim overalls, flannel shirts. And on the back, the backing is pieced um, from mule feed sacks. Um, so um, it's really kind of an icon of the Southern um, tenant or um, sharecropper farmer. Now we are fortunate to have 34 of Susanna's quilts in our collection and you can see they are all different. And um, I think she balances her compositions in really interesting ways. And if you were around in 2008, you know we put these quilts on exhibit. And um, here is coming up a picture, a few pictures from that exhibit which put these quilts in context. Uh, the quilts were later exhibited at the Grand Rapids um, uh, Art Museum. And right now they are on their way to North Carolina where um, there will be another exhibit of her quilts. And I'm going down there to give a talk in about a month. Now our other, if I can call them star quilters, cause they are, is Susan McCord, which many of you um, may have um, come across before. Many years ago, we did do a Susan McCord exhibit. And Susan, like Susanna, was a farm wife, but she lived in Indiana on an um, 80 acre farm. And, you know, she's doing the same stuff that Susanna Hunter was. She's cooking, cleaning, preserving foods, making clothes, for her family, caring for her vegetable and flower garden. And she's also said to have read her Bible through once a year. So how did she find the time to make all these quilts that I'm about to show you? Well, she probably used scraps of time just as she did scraps of fabric, just like Susanna Hunter. So we have 13 of Susan McCord's quilts. Um, and the workmanship is just exquisite. And even though she may kind of work off of quilting ideas that are popular at the time, she always does her own twist on them. And um, her stitches are unfailingly even. They average about 10 per inch. Um, and she loved gardening. So you're gonna see a lot of flowers on Susan's quilt. And I find her sense of color and design just extraordinary. And she can take these traditional designs and uh, make them quite, um, quite extraordinary. And um, her signature is going to be these wonderful vine borders with pieced leaves. This floral urn quilt is one of her earlier ones that we own, um, made about 1860. And um, it's, um, these kind of um, floral applique quilts were very popular in the mid 19th century, but once again, she makes it her own. Check out those fuchsias, flowers on the, um, the different blocks. Uh, they're really quite um, whimsical and wonderful. Um, and even this early, she's starting her signature pieced leaves. If you look at that detail up in the right hand corner, you can see that the leaves on her vines are pieced out of um, separate pieces of fabric. Now, Susan McCord is also known for using teeny tiny little pieces in her quilt. It's kind of hard to totally um, understand this from looking at this, but um, 
she she made this quilt about 1880 it's an ocean wave and all of those little triangular pieces that she sews together are about a half inch each extraordinary and um this is a pieced quilt but she's also done her floral um vine and leaf border there along the uh the edges of the quilt now the next one is what we consider susan's masterpiece it's this wonderful vine quilt um and this a detail of this quilt is what appeared on the announcement of the thf con um, conversation materials they received and somebody called this an encyclopedia of late 19th century inexpensive printed cottons each of these panels has 300 leaves and there are 13 panels so we have 3900 pieced leaves and each of those of course are made from these pieced fabrics she probably strip pieced these um, often sewing together some fabric in strips and then cutting out leaves to um, then applique onto the uh, the backing but this is just an amazing quilt and then Susan, even though she was getting on in years, she kept up with what was going on in the quilt world. In the late 19th century, crazy quilts were in, and um, she made a few of her own versions. These are generally made with silks and velvets and other sorts of um, fancier material scraps. And usually in a fan quilt, you usually put the fan in the corner of the block and all the fans are the same size. So you get this very regular look to it when you finish up. Um, she didn't do that. She made her fan corners uh, different sizes. And when she put them together, this is what happened. And I just find this has uh, such, this random placement gives such energy and motion to her quilts. All right, let's take a quick look, because um, I know you want to see the rest of her quilts. Here are the remaining quilts that um, she made that we have in our collection. Um, the Harrison Rose Floral Urn. Um, the large flower in the center of that urn is known as um, uh, the Harrison Rose after William Henry Harrison, who was the first territorial governor of Indiana, where she was from, as well as being our ninth president. And if you notice, each edge of this quilt has a different trailing vine. Uh, the turkey tracks is a little simpler, perhaps, but check out that border on the left side. It's a vine, once again, with the pieced um, uh, leaves on it. And we kind of wonder if this isn't an earlier piece that she added on to this later made quilt and wonder if this wasn't made for a specific bed, like one that was against the wall. Now, I mentioned earlier to you that um, there was going to be a very creative version of the Princess Feather or Feathered Star, as we call this one. Um, she made this about 1890. It's based on that princess feather pattern, but once again, she's used those great Susan McCord pieced leaves to make it all her own. Um, a couple more quilts made out of tiny little pieces sewn together, including this hexagon mosaic made about 1900. Um, this pattern is sometimes also called a honeycomb. And the diamond field coming up here, uh, made about 10 years earlier, 1890. And this is sometimes called Rainbow or uh, Martha Washington's Flower Garden. And it is so fun to look at all the different fabrics in these. Uh, Susan made at least two more crazy quilts. The one on the left looks surprisingly modern. And it's made out of dress velvets and millinery ribbons. Um, and the one on the right is a little bit more of a traditional crazy quilt um, that's made of these pieces all put together. Although you see, she does have some fans still in there. And um, she has done embroidery of floral and foliage motifs on um, a lot of the pieces in there. And last but not least is her um, 
triple Irish chain on the left. This is a quilt that I had the honor of acquiring for the museum back in 2011. And on the right is a, a pine tree quilt, which she never um, finished quilting. She pieced it all, but the family had someone else quilt it much later. And just before the pandemic hit, we um, acquired over a hundred crib and doll quilts that had been gathered by Paul Pilgrim and Gerald Roy um, over a 50 year period. They started in 1969 and they date from um, about 19 or 1800 to about 1940. And they are just absolutely beautiful. So I thought I'd give you a sneak peek at a few of them. There's a Star of Lemoyne, uh, floral applique and some bars. And here we have um, a doll quilt and um, well, a couple doll quilts. I love the printed patchwork quilt in the middle, which shows scenes from the Mikado, a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. And um, that gorgeous Tide Comforter on the uh, right hand side, which is from Pennsylvania. So there's more where those came from and I'll talk in a minute about how you can see them. Now, research on these quilts takes time and we have this wonderful group of volunteers who does this work. Um, Emily Niedering is a quilt maker. You can see her with her quilt. She has worked on the quilt index project for us, which I'll talk about. She's researched pattern names and she's our ace in the hole on describing cataloging construction. And Joe and Gil um, do a lot of the research, the background research, uh, biographical research on quilt makers. Um, Chris is a textile historian who also helps uh, research some of the uh, quilts in our collection. Now, how do you photograph these things? They're big. Uh, well, they don't fit in our current photographic studio for um, the photographers to be able to get back and um, get a good shot. So they have to um, take photos out on the museum floor. You can see the camera there up on the Highland Park engine pointing down um, towards the quilts. And um, they, uh, Rudy and um, Jillian and our um, other staff members have photographed a lot more of the quilts in recent years, and I've been extremely grateful for their work. All right, I told you I was going to tell you how you can see these better. Um, we have put 275 of our quilts on our digital collections website. I don't know if you have had a chance to look at this, but it includes more than 100,000 digitized collection objects from our collection and um, very, very nice um, high fidelity photography on there. And um, so you can explore these quilts in more, um, more uh, detail. And Kat has just put the, um, the link to our website on there that you can see. Um, it's also on the slide. Um, okay, so I apologize for the quick look at a lot of our quilts, but I know that you'll be able to explore them um, better through our digital collections. And I wanted to introduce you to our collection and show you as many as I could. And you can also see our quilts on something called the Quilt Index. Um, the Quilt Index was, is, um, spearheaded by Michigan State University staff. They launched it in 2003, and it's basically a big digital um, database of images and information about quilts from all kinds of museums, libraries, private collections. And a few years ago, we did a project with interns, which Emily Niedering um, helped out a lot. Um, and we managed to get 122 of our quilts so far listed on the quilt index. So while you can take a look at them on our website, if people are looking more broadly at quilts from many different collections, they can find quilts from all over the place on this website. And it gives information about construction, uh, quilt maker, just whatever is known. And the pictures that you see before you are some of the ones from our collection that are on this. Right, well, I 
thank you for joining me today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this rather flying through our collection journey. And now if you have questions, um, I will be glad to answer them. Gosh, excellent. Thank you so much, Jeannie, for this program. It's really, it's a joy to see the special quilts that aren't usually on display in the museum in the village. And, and my gosh, the stories of how they're created is just super fascinating. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, we have time for questions. We have a few minutes and some questions are continuing to come in. Um, why don't we start with uh, the first one? How did quilt patterns like the log cabin or the crazy quilts, um, how did they get their names? And then how are those names adopted by the quilting community? Like how do they get communicated? Well, probably early on, a lot of quilts were just patterns and they didn't have names. Um, so many of the names that are familiar to us now were probably unknown to a lot of 19th century um, quilt makers, if names even existed um, for those quilts at that time. Now, when you start getting um, after the Civil War and certainly um, by the end of the 19th century, you get a lot more magazines and um, catalogs that are beginning to share quilt patterns um, through this communications media. And that's when um, a lot of quilts will acquire a name. But those names, um, as Kat kind of alluded to, kind of morph um, because many of the names for the same pattern might be regional. They call them something in one place like log cabin, um, but that also is called sometimes courthouse steps. So um, the importance of pattern names grows um, by the late 18th and early 20th century. Next, let's go with, um, what is the most intricate quilt in the Henry Ford's collection? Um, and this is kind of a two-parter. Also, what is the most historically significant in your opinion? That would be very hard to answer. Um, many of these quilts are very intricate. Um, you know, of course, what comes to mind first is Susan um, McCord's vine quilt because it's made of all those little tiny pieces um, that are pieced together and then appliqued onto the, um, you know, the fabric. And in terms of historically significant, I mean, you know, there are so many that are significant for different reasons sometimes for the statement they make. And I find, um, while I might be blown away by the, um, you know, the intricacy of some of these masterpieces, um, the simple ones just tug at my heart too. When I walk down that quilt aisle and I look at all those, I, I kind of see the women behind them, even though I can't really see the women, but um, I can kind of feel them behind their work. Oh, that's lovely. It is. It does. It feels like like a very intimate connection, you know, it's something that someone's made out of care and it's this beautiful object that now lasts. Gosh, that's really lovely. Uh, the next question is about a specific quilt that you mentioned uh, or you showed us today, the Revolutionary War story quilt, um, I think made in the 1970s. And the question is, did the maker sew each of those scenes uh, kind of from scratch or was yeah. that pattern fabric? Uh, no, as I mentioned, she designed all those scenes. She, her daughter-in-law and her grandson. And she got inspired by looking at an old history book, but she created all those scenes, cut out all that fabric and stitched it um, in place on the quilt. And that's why it took her like, whatever nine months you know 10 or 12 hours a day so. oh gosh it's so remarkable yeah we i'm now seeing uh, a number of questions coming in about the links that were in the chat um, yes. and mainly if those are are public and shareable you know can you, can you just speak to that a little bit yes of course and that's why we put them in there um we had hoped to be able to go right to them from the PowerPoint, but it might have kind of derailed our, 
our PowerPoint together. So that's why we put them in the, the chat. But yeah, you can copy those. Um, they will take you right to the sites, both our collections website and also the uh, Quilt Index website. Fantastic, thank you. Um, next, this is a, a kind of a construction, I think, or a care question. Um, Kimberly says, what beautiful quilts, um, and it's great to hear the stories of their designers. What can be done for a quilt that has some deteriorizing or deterioration um, to repair it? Okay, I'm not a, I'm not a conservator, but I'll um, address that a little bit. Um, sometimes it's because of wear that you, you know, that happens to quilts, but there's also dyes that tend to eat into the fabric over time. Like there's a brown that tends to do that. And some colors are more fugitive than others and um, more readily um, fade in the sun. Um, but one of the um, mantras of conservation is never do anything that's not reversible. So oftentimes you can take um, crepeline and some of our quilts have this. It, you know, you can see through that it's very light and you lay it on top where the quilt might be fraying and then you carefully hand stitch it in place so that it stabilizes the quilt. Um, we do have on our website um, information about how to uh, preserve textiles. So if you look at our website um, in the Benson Ford Research Center um, section, I think um, you'll find your way to it. We should have had that link for you today. I'm sorry, but uh, it's very good information. Oh, that's great. Thank you. There's, I hadn't, you know, as you've been showing us all the quilts in our collections, I hadn't really given much thought about that until the question came in that, you know, fabric is, is not like a, a necessarily a hard material. And so there must be great care. And so thanks for that kind of look into conservation. That's really a whole other interesting quilt topic. Absolutely. Um, so next, I am seeing several questions about where um, or what our future plans might be for exhibitions or displays of either specific quilts, like the nude is not a color quilt, um, or quilting in general, even from folks who remember kind of a uh, past quilting exhibit. Uh, is there anything that you can share about upcoming opportunities uh, to see our yeah. quilts out in the museum? At present, there are no um, solid ones. Um, and we're, uh, yeah, I hope many of you did get a chance to say, see nude is not a color uh, while it was up. Um, there will be some um, kind of, uh, well, a new gallery opening up potentially in the back of the museum, if I may share that, um, which we may be able to do some, um, different temporary exhibits in. Um, and so I hope that quilts might be among them, but if you want, you can contact the museum and <laughs> say you would love to see some more quilt exhibits and we'll see where that takes us. And just from the number of comments in the chat and a couple of questions in the Q&A, um, I think we have passionate desire to see more quilting exhibits uh, and virtual talks. Um, and, and there is a question about if this presentation and this program will be available. Uh, all of our THF conversations for members are recorded and then made available on our YouTube channel. Uh, so for those who would like to see the recording again or share it, um, you can just head over to our YouTube. It will be available. It usually takes about a couple of days after the program, but then you can also see all of the previous programs as well. Um, so now, I think that this is probably going to be our, our last question, just based on time for today. Um, folks are kind of asking, what quilts are you looking to collect next um, for the institution? And then kind of where is the Henry Ford's uh, quilt collecting going to go from here? Well, um, we need to collect quilts that um, are of more recent decades. We still do collect traditional quilts, as you saw from the crib quilts, um, but we are um, making a greater focus on um, quilts from the quilt revival that happens at the time of the bicentennial when people like me were learning to quilt. Um, and that has just picked up steam since then. So um, 
things from you know the late um, uh, 20th century and certainly from the early 21st century. We have put a big emphasis lately on the modern quilt movement, um, which um, people like Susanna Hunter were kind of in the front of that. Um, but it's where you see um, very non-traditional patterns and colors. Um, and often these are intended more for um, hanging on walls than on beds, but they go off the grid and they use um, asymmetry. Um, often they're less fussy, um, very minimalist designs and, um, a, you know, once again, a more improvisational style. So we also don't have um, tons of Amish quilts in our collection. We do have Mennonite, um, which perhaps I can show you another time. Um, so there are still some traditional quilts um, that I would like to see represented in the collection. But I have to say, um, in my years here, whatever they've been, 15 or so, as um, the uh, curator of this quilt collection, I think I have made it grow by about a third. <laughs> so they are beautiful. They are beautiful. And they're not only beautiful to look at, they, you know, kind of touch your heart. And a favorite for so many people, I think, just as a part of the Henry Ford's collection. So, so thank you so much to Jamie um, for this program and to everyone joining us uh, today. Uh, I think, you know, our members know we do love to share our passion for history and for the Henry Ford uh, with members. And we're always so grateful that you continue to connect with us here in virtual programs like this. Uh, so if you enjoyed today's program, uh, I hope we'll see you again at our next virtual program. Uh, that'll be next month in October, um, when we'll be taking a special sneak peek at our next temporary exhibit, Collecting Mobility, New Objects, New Stories, uh, with our Curator of Transportation, Matt Anderson. Uh, so finally, as we wrap up today, um, thank you again to all of our members for all that you do to support the Henry Ford uh, and I hope to see you next time.